I'm Jane Treger, and this is Talking Arts. We're continuing our conversations with local artists, and today we have Sandra Hayes. Hello. And uh, we, we, I have many, many questions to ask of Sandra. Uh, note at the bottom of the screen, there's an email. If you have questions you want me to ask that I'm not asking, please do. Right now at the Deerfield Arts Bank, which is where we're sitting, uh, we have an exhibit called Weaving Up and Down, 13 Tapestry Weavers. And the next exhibit coming up in mid-April will be Landscapes. Around us is um, another exhibit, but right central here in the middle is uh, the work of uh, Sandra's work. Sandra. Yes. Actually, before we go on, is mm -hmm. it Sandra or is it Sandra? Sandra. With an a. Sandra. Well, they're both with an A. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> one is, you know, one ending on British. British. The a. <laughs> right. So uh, you do so many things. Mm -hmm. And it's really exciting. Every time I look at something you do, it's like someplace else and, and ingenious. What do you call that? Um, it's called concept art. Um, you start with an idea and then you make the materials work for the idea as opposed to start with the materials and try to come up with an idea for those materials. What a great description. Thank you. That was perfect. <laughs> You're welcome. So are you a local girl? Yeah, I grew up here. Um, I moved away for 20 years and now I'm back. Happy you to be must, back. You are, I think, in a minority so far in the people I've interviewed. So. Um, uh, so, so you're up in Bernardston now, is that right? Yes. Right. And um, when did you become an artist? Did you always know you would be an artist? Were you drawing as a kid? I'm still or wondering if I'm an artist. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um, I was always doing something with my hands, even as a child. Um, but as far as being an artist, that wasn't probably until my 20s that I realized that I wasn't going to be a scientist. So. I see. Well, did you go to art school? Uh, yeah, a couple of them. <laughs> Let's hear. Who that, where that? Um, I that? went to Greenfield Community College for a couple of years. Um, In their art department? Yep. Who'd you study with there? Um, Margaret Stein and, um, oh gosh. We'll come back to that. Yeah, <laughs> 20 years ago. Oh, okay, all right. Fair um, enough. Fair enough. I went to the Hill Institute, which is the weaving school down in Florence near Northampton. Wonderful place. Yep. And there I studied with Janetta Jones for four years. Um, I became a master weaver in 1994. Uh -huh. um, after that, um, I studied um, art at University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Um, I had gotten my accounting degree. I was working at the university. They let me take classes for free. So, and they didn't care what I took them in, so I took art classes. Did I hear accounting? Yes, I'm an accountant. accountant. You're an accountant? Yes, day job. That's, that's your day job. That's a quite a, sp I don't know, that's a hard one for me to fathom, frankly. From accountant to artist, you're working two sides of your brain. Yeah. Well, no, they work together. I mean, they, everything comes together in one Yes, actually, I think, I think the accounting is going to be accounted for <laughs> in some of the stuff we're going to be discussing. Yep. Now I get it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you said that you started um, doing work in, in fibers and textiles as a kid. Yep. Um, well, uh, in, uh, crochet. Knitting? Cro crocheting. Crocheting. I started to crochet, I don't remember when. I was really little. I really don't remember learning to crochet. Uh, I know my mother taught me at some point in time, but I was so small that I don't have a firm memory of it. Um, also, at that point in time, learned embroidery. Um, learned knitting later. Knitting didn't take for some reason. And then... Um, me neither. <laughs> I can do it now, but it's, it's not my first choice. And then I started weaving when I was 10 years old. And um, I had two. Somebody must have shown you. Yeah, yeah, no, I had two aunts. Um, they're both named Abby, and they were both weavers. And um, they taught me different aspects. One taught me tapestry, the other taught me floor loom, hand weaving. Uh -huh. um, and then a little more weaving in high school, and then later, um, I really loved it a lot, so I went to the Hill Institute. So there's a few. There are a few things. There are two things here that are. 
um, crochet. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to talk about this now, or do they f does it fit in a little later? Sure, we can talk about it now. Okay. Um, so one item is, I, we have a lot of distraction behind us, but I, I hope you can see this. Well, anyway, we'll get we'll get a good shot of it on the on the on the screen. Mm -hmm. It looks like a brain with yep. with needles in it, <laughs> and numbers on all the right. little tags. So these are actually map pins. So the whole piece is called surreal estate. Surreal estate. Surreal estate. This came about because I had a uh, dream. Um, one morning I woke up and I had a dream about this young man that I had a crush on when I was in high school. Thirty years later, I'm like, why did that memory come up? It didn't make any sense. I had not thought of this poor boy in 30 years, and somehow my dreamscape had like run through the card catalog and pulled him out, and I was like, how does that happen? And so I crocheted a brain, and these are all the little map pins of those memories. You know, his, this guy, and the bubble gum, and whatever else. There's a map in our head. And it's our memories that are the location points. So that's why the pins are numbered. But there's something unusual about this crocheting. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I crochet, and I don't know how to do what you you're, what. How do you do that? OK, it's a It's all turned in on itself. Right. Um, the technique is called hyperbolic crocheting. And um, is that this thing, too? Yeah, this is another version. This one is primeval real estate. Primeval acrylic, excuse me. <laughs> Primeval acrylic. Right. Because um, I thought it looked like something that might come out of a primeval swamp. And, you know, our whole, um, this goes back to those concepts of ideas. Our whole um, energy culture is based off of what came out of a primeval swamp. We have acrylic, we have oil in our cars, so. But how do you make it do that? <laughs> It's a matter of increasing at a regular or irregular manner. Um, when you increase, usually when you crochet, you try to make something flat. And so you control the increases so, and do decreases so that you make something the shape that you want it. This is a case of letting those increases and decreases in the crocheting become beyond flat. And so that's how we get all the little ripples and the curves. and. This seems like the accountant part. Uh, yeah, I mean... I mean, I, this is not, you know, one likes to think of books as flat and brains as wrinkled, but here we have this thoughtful process of adding numbers mm -hmm. and, and take, then taking them away. Right. This is, this is more complicated than I think I can do. You teach this, don't you? Yes, I do. Where do you teach this? Um, at Sheep and Shawl oh, here in nice Deerfield. Oh, nice place. Yes, Lovely. very nice place. So, um, okay, so let's move on to, shall we do, tell me about the diaries, because I, I think that's sort of fundamental to almost everything you do. Yeah, it is fundamental. Um, the diaries, I started when I was 16, and I've been, I never stopped, so we're... This picture we see over here, that's the, that's, you've got all the diaries in a row. Right. That one's called Thought Processed. Um, the jar at the end of the image is a full of um, sugar water and a pair of my socks and tea, because I operate a lot on tea. <laughs> and, and socks? <laughs> well, the socks are a representation of action. You know, you put on your socks, you put on your shoes, you go do something. Uh -huh. um, and so there's a connection between thought and action. And it's all in that jar. And all of the, the thought is, is all of those diaries behind that jar where everything gets planned. How, how many feet is that? Um, probably about 15 feet. 15 feet of little diaries, yeah. li like, like these? Yep. And what's in them? I mean, well, okay. wh what is the, no, let me ask it differently. What in these diaries connects to your artistic world? Everything. I mean, every, th oh. every thought, every dream, every stray ticket stub, it all gets included in the diary. 
and then sometimes it come the artwork comes out of the diary. Is that is that this one here, for instance? Yeah, this one. Um, What's it called? It's called Before Stage One Sleep, and it's a um, in the diaries I was working with crayons, and so this is this is actually like Crayola wax crayons, and. Um, I was doing them for years and years and years in the diaries, and I figured maybe I uh, actually bring it out of the diary and put it on good paper. Ah. Uh -huh. So sometimes. Um, this is the active brain before you fall asleep. Mm-hmm. This is what it looks like behind my eyes. Oh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. Must be hard to get to sleep. Right. With such an active. Yeah. Sometimes. Sometimes the diary literally becomes writing. Um, in, in an artwork. So this piece is called Introverted. It's an altered clothing piece. Put it up a little higher perhaps. Um, so let me hold it up while you okay. speak. So obviously we were talking about me being an accountant. An accountant requires a certain wardrobe to be business. So we've got what looks like a straight up wardrobe. Problem is there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes on inside and so we have a list of diary entries and all of those diary entries you can see if you turn the jacket the other way around that there's something going on inside um, so there's a lot of my work has a lot of complex there are all sorts of words in here right Sheets. those are actual diary entries on fabric on fabric you wrote them on fabric I wrote them on fabric sewed them into the back of the jacket slashed the jacket open from the back do you have another copy Nope. This is it. I, I mean, mean of, of the diary uh, No, no, the diary entries, the, the paper diary entries are in the diary, but there's those particular, I just transcribed so, particular entries so into it's fabric. So like, it's like carrying all your memories and thoughts with you on your back forever. Mm-hmm. And that No matter what the outfit is. Right. And that there's a lot of things, don't worry about that, there's a lot of things that happen that people never see. We're a society that we're, we're talking about the public and the, 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 the idea of privacy. I keep a diary. The diary is a private thing. And so in this particular culture, we're struggling constantly right now with, with what we share and what we don't share. And so my work has that idea. Here we don't share, but we sort of let on that it's there. Right. Uh-huh. Nice. Mm -hmm. So... Um, do we want to talk, do you want to show me some, may I put this down on the yep. floor? Um, do you want to show me some of the diaries? Sure. Go ahead. Um, some of these we have images for. Right. This is um, called Bridge Across Troubled Waters. Um, most of the diaries that I have, most of the volumes are commercial volumes, printed, bought at bookstores. Um, it wasn't until this past year that I started actually making my own books. Um, and sewing them. And sewing them. Binding them. Right? Binding them myself. And so um, I, f I feel kind of silly. It's like I should have known I should make books after 30 years of diary keeping, but it took a while. So. Oh. So you asked me what's in the diary. Okay, so what's in the diary is a lot of drawing and writing and um, just exploring seeing what I can come up with. Um, so you paint in the page. Yep, and so you, collage. So your paper is, is, is a watercolor paper or some good quality paper that you're... Yeah, I, uh, in order to make something archival, you want to make sure you have good paper. But actually, these colored pieces are um, a dollar store coloring book. Oh. That I've, you know, I've been painting, painting onto the dollar store coloring book and then cutting the coloring book picture up and then putting pen and ink drawings over the top of it. So it came, this, this image that we saw a minute ago came out of something you had in your book and you decided to make a larger version of it. Yep. And the work that you see here, these, this um, uh, surreal estate, mm -hmm. as in surrealism plus real right. estate, yep. uh, also was something that you had drawn in your book. Yep. A and, and can you show us Another okay. one? Yep. And another one? Yep. So the one you have in your hand, um, this, the outside is an actual um, commercial fabric that I used when I was a textile designer. I 
said I lived in North Carolina for 20 years. I worked as a textile designer. This down is there. your design? That's my design. And it was woven on a commercial loom. I did upholstery fabrics. And then, so, construction of the book. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so there's a lot of different stuff in there. Um, so this particular one I haven't used as a um, journal for myself. Um, it's got um, glass beads on the binding. This you're, one is you're putting this in the red and white and yeah, uh, black and black uh, and black and white, white and red, red all, all over. over. Right. Um, this one's called wing repair. So we have an X-ray skeleton of a hawk that had a broken wing, and um, on the back is an same image of, image of that same hawk with the. Um, pins that they had put in the bone to um, repair it. Um, this image comes from the, let me make sure I want to get this right. Um, it's from the Toronto Wildlife Center uh -huh. um, and they get over 3,000 calls a year from people who have found animals mm -hmm. and that they do repairs on. So the, I, the concept was that people, diary writing can heal and so, oh, the pages have an elbow. The pages are all have a break in them, and or a hinge. A hinge, and so, if you're in the process of healing, you need to concentrate on what can be repaired. And then in the center, I have some spare parts. Spare parts. <laughs> Spare parts. Oh. So I have some moth wings and some... Um, Very good if you're a wasp. moth. Right. So sometimes you need a little help, and sometimes you need to scrounge from whatever you can get to uh -huh. help the healing. So that's... That's quite extraordinary. I, now I'm, I'm really getting the sense of this concept right. art. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, and it's got hand-painted end papers. Um, so... Uh-huh. So um, a little bit more over here. Yep. This is more of, um, okay, you, you, you are also an installation artist. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if this is the first one to start with, but there, we actually have a, 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 a very tiny little, um, is it a YouTube? Um, it's a, vi it's a yeah, video. Yeah, it's a little video. And, and, and we'll, while, while it's showing, could you tell us what's, what this is? This is um, a very small, um, what's called a flexon. It's a flexible book. And um, this particular one is four pages, and so the four pages show, depending on how you fold the book. Or um, unfold it. Or unfold it, and it's called Flexible Truths. And um, the particular one is, once again, what's going on in my head. Um, you know, I'm looking for keys for combination locks. And right. I think a lot of people do that. We, 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 we keep looking for keys for things, and there's no keys. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So it's hard to show work like this because you have to let people touch it. So that's why you have the video, I suppose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also because you, you don't necessarily know how things are going to work if it's, it's time-dependent or if it's flexible or fold, folding. So. Uh-huh. But you also make much larger installations. Mm -hmm. So another one we have, here's a picture of it right here, is, um, what, let me see, uh, hmm, I'm trying to remember what it's called. It's the one with the, the two, the two uh, sweatshirts. Oh, Comfort Zone. Comfort Zone, <laughs> yes, Comfort Zone. What is that? Comfort it's Zone. Is that huge? It's pretty big. It's about five feet to six feet across, depending on where it's installed. You understand, we have a picture only, but it was, it's, it's an installation piece, so it's installed in a space. Right. Right now, it's currently installed at, in the sanctuary of the Berniston Unitarian Church. Oh. Um, and every time I install it, it gets a different shape. Um, oh. Because it's flexible. Um, and what is it? It's two sweatshirts. It's a lot of... Um, what is its meaning first? Let's what try is that. It, it's, it's, a, it's a representation of what two people's bodies can be when they're united. United like? In love. Oh, in love. Okay. <laughs> but not making love necessarily. Not necessarily, no. Okay. 
Um, the way this piece was constructed is that um, I took two sweatshirts, one I wore and one my husband wore, and we laid down on our bed, and I can show you images of these. Um, we laid down on our bed in a particular position that we go to sleep in every night, and then we got our sons to draw lines and pin us together in the two sweatsuits. And then I used those lines as sewing guides. Um, my sewing machine has programmable letters, so I programmed le um, words from our love letters together and sewed the two sweatsuits together. And then I took the seams. You, took, you sewed it together using the, the words. words from our love letters. Is that visible when one is up next to it? Mm -hmm. You have to get up pretty close, but you can read it. Uh -huh. um, and then. Um, once again, we're going back to concepts. So I have my wedding rings. Our wedding rings have a rainbow on the inside of them. And so when I sewed it together, I made sure that the thread had that same sort of rainbows. Uh -huh. um, so you, you try to put idea and meaning into every piece of the artwork that you're working with, uh -huh. you know, from the thread. Sweatsuits are what we put on when we're comfortable. We go home, we we uh -huh. get out of the business clothes and we put on the sweatsuits. So they're a comfort fabric. Mm -hmm. um, so then, once I had the pieces sewn together along the seams where we where our bodies meet, I took out the other seams. So all of the inseams on the arms, all of the inseams in the legs, those got taken out. So what had been two separate outfits now became one sculpture. Incredible. I think I, uh, I, it's, it's mysterious to look at, but it's, um, it's beautiful with, with a story. Right. Right. A lot of, a lot of the concept art comes about, you know, what if? What if I do this? What if I sew this in this manner and then take out the seams? It's, it's a question that well, I don't know what well, I'll always get. Well, let's, let's look at, oh, perhaps before, this is recent work, yes? No. Mm, yeah, they're all recent works here. Well, let's in the last five years. Okay, so let's continue in, 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 the, um, hmm, in the sewing world. Let's okay. Or installation, which one? Either one, you pick. Okay, sewing world. Okay. So we have an image of this too. Yeah. Okay. This is called A Chromatopsia Caused Me to Name the Cat After Bridget Riley. That's catchy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Bridget Riley was a um, op artist from the 60s. And so the background fabric here is um, shadow weave, which I, I hand wove. So this is my hand woven fabric that I'm stitching over the top of. Um, Achromatopsia is a form of color blindness. Oh, um, this will take us to this. Yes. Right, that will take us to this. Yes. So um, my father is color blind, completely color blind. He sees no color at all. And so that's what achromatopsia is. Um, so this is actually an image of um, the retina, the back of our eye. Oh, yes. So we have an optic nerve, and then there are cone cells around that, and then there are the veins of the, of the eye that feed the retina. So in achromatopsia, there's a larger blind spot around the optic nerve, and so that's what this big black spot is. It's, it's actually a blind spot that my father can't see around. Well, I don't know. In some cases, knowing what it is makes it more meaningful. I guess it still remains that. Yeah. But it's also beautiful and interesting without knowing what this is. Right. Right. So, so, so tell us about, well, I'll let you unfold okay. this. This is an installation piece right. that's this also about? About genetics and color blindness. Um, this is Put it toward the camera. Put, okay. This is um, called Carrier. And, and why is it on underwear? <laughs> let's, get, let's get to that right away. Okay. It's on underwear because it's about genetic um, progression. I see. It, it's about... Okay. It's, it's as close as you can mm -hmm. get to those parts. Right. Yes. I see. I got it. So what is written all over in white and red? What, um, it's a, um, it's the genetic code for chromatopsia. So I've got C's and A's and T's and G's, what you, the letters of DNA. And, and, and how did this show up in some space? Okay. So, um, I work Repeat. at universities 
and um, uh, there's a one pair of underwear for each person in my family. Oh. And um, they're put together in what's a genetic pedigree for my family. Um, and I'm a carrier for this particular eye disease. I'm also a carrier for the other type of color blindness, which is the red green color blindness most people are familiar with. Yeah. So when research goes on, we try to hide the identity of people who have these disorders yes. um, to protect them. But my identity, a lot of my artwork, comes about because of this stuff. And so, so once again, we're doing the public-private thing. Who I am is dictated by the fact that I carry the, these disorders. Yes. And so the piece is about, once again, that public-private space. So the, you laid out all the, the, the sort the, of a genealogy. I, uh, I laid out the genealogy of and, a, and a pair of underwear for, for each, each person. person. Yep. And so you could see who, who has it and who doesn't. Doesn't. Right. right. Uh -huh. And who's a carrier, which is me. Uh huh. Which is you. Right. So. And so let's, let's take that to. So you do a lot of other installation art. Mm -hmm. we, we're not going to cover this, but this, right. is, this, is what, this is what you yeah. really once like it, to do. Yeah. So it's very it, small work and very large work. Yeah. Now Once again, it comes back to the idea. <laughs> here's a medium-sized piece. Right. Would There's not like, many of those, actually. <laughs> yeah, so this is unique. Mm -hmm. So you, would you like to tell us what, first of all, maybe, does it have a title? Yeah, this one's called um, Decoration of Free Trade. This is like a eulogy to my textile career. Oh. <laughs> um, the... In textiles, the main motif is paisleys, and has been for centuries. And so we've got a paisley motif going on. And then we've got, um, it's all made out of cardboard. And in free trade, most everything gets wrapped in cardboard and shipped around. So my textile career got shipped off. And oh. um, that sounds like a horrible thing. but. It's just how things go. I mean, we have a, a shifting society. So this is all cardboard boxes. It, it's yeah, it's all cardboard. You actually told me it was one cardboard. It was box. one one sheet of five by eight cardboard. All of this is created from one sheet of five by eight cardboard. Did you yep. plan ahead? Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. I mean, it's it's there's some planning that goes along. You start and you keep going, and then you keep trying things. You. You figure, try to figure out how much you can do with cardboard, so you start. Well, I think you can do an awful lot. This is. I quite discovered a I can do a lot of a lot because you. I mean, you're taking apart the pieces. Yep. And doing different things with it. Yep. And manipulating it, and it's not, like, it's not simple. It's not um, primitive. It's mm. it's really intricate and pretty extraordinary. Thank you. So, um, what are you doing Okay, now? so this is current this is work. Current work. What is this? This is one of my husband's old t-shirts, and obviously it's got Thoreau on it. Oh, um, Thoreau, yes, of Thoreau. course. Thoreau. You can't be a New Englander without having yes. Thoreau thrown in somewhere. Um, so it says simplify across the top, and I find that I struggle with simplicity a lot. I see. So this piece is called Embellish. Oh. <laughs> and once I'm done with the embroidery, I'll go all the way around. Um, it will become a book cover. A bigger book. A bigger book. To add to that long row of books. Yes. Well, I'm very grateful that you brought all of these things in. Thank you. It's not always easy to make sure that you've covered everything. Have I covered everything? You're wearing a piece. <gasps> oh, I forgot. So tell me about that. I'm wearing a piece. Tell me. Um, this is a commissioned piece that I did. Um, this is actually my mother's necklace. Um, the reason I'm using the amber is because she's originally from um, Poland, or her family is Polish, and so Baltic amber is from that area. Um, and then the piece itself is hand-woven silver. Um, once again, it's a matter of, of taking techniques and cross, crossing mediums. And so I did a lot of um, weaving and crocheting with wire. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you so much for coming in. Thank you for sharing. And um, I look forward to more things from you. So 
Thank you for joining us. This is Jane Treger in Talking Art. We're at the Deerfield Arts Bank. I think I said incorrectly before, our next exhibit is black and white and red all over. Red, R-E-A-D. And after that will be Land Escape. And uh, 